Um, Ephesians chapter 3, if you will, this morning. And we'll get into our study here. I, I want to do a couple things. One more thing here about the Bible. Uh, and then next week we'll be in California for the Bible conference. That'll be online, I'm sure, through John's site, helpersofyourjoy.com. So if you want to pile in, hopefully some of you are going that I'm aware of. And uh, we will have service here and so forth. And then when we come back um, at the end of February, we're going to start a series I did about five or six years ago uh, about the heavenly places and going to the heavenlies and everything. And in uh, Ephesians 3... Um, actually, you know, real quick, look over at chapter 1 of Ephesians, just to give you an, a flavor for what's coming, and then we'll get into chapter 3. Uh, Ephesians 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, notice the, ne- the title now, the Father of Glory. And that's what we're going to title the next messages after we come back, looking at glory, looking at the heavenly places, looking at how we get there. And then uh, I've got to get the base back into your thinking. (laughs) And then when we move forward on some uh, new stuff that I've studied and everything, and uh, maybe some new new, new insight into some of that, okay? Because it's critical, I think, one of the items that we don't talk a lot about is the heavenly places and what we're doing up there and where we're going and Uh, First of all, there's not a clear understanding amongst most, come over to chapter 3 of Ephesians now, about the heavenly places at all, period, and how we get there. And uh, there's a lot of confusion about that, and and it's needless confusion. It doesn't need to be. The verses are pretty clear. Folks, when you read verses and you let the verses say what they say and mean what they mean, then you're safe. It's when you try to interject different ideas that begins, like that word prosperous, you know, we were talking about last hour, you know, fruitful, (laughs) you know, usually when you talk about prosperity, you're talking about money, when Paul isn't talking about that, he's talking about fruit and so forth, so anyway, all right, Ephesians chapter number three, we've been looking here in verse nine, ten, and eleven, and uh, about uh, some things and, and and Satan's attack. Uh, on uh, on the message and on the Word of God. And last week we talked about the Bible Project and about our responsibility as a local assembly. Someone told me that they quit watching at noon. I said, you can go back and pick up at noon and watch the last 20 minutes. That's the best part. <laughs> the other just got you there because it's, it becomes our responsibility. And we talked before that about the issue of who left Jesus out of that verse in verse number uh, and in verse number 9 there, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And they leave Jesus Christ out, and, and so they begin to, to mess that up. So in thinking about that, and in thinking about how the, the attack is, is, is there, come over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm trying to find something here, and it's not in this book. This Bible's not very easy to flip through. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, notice, if you will, verse number 3. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his... Subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is where? In Christ. See, there's a simplicity about this. And what Satan does is he begins to attack. And he's, we looked at the issue of him attacking the seed line, Adam and Eve and Noah and those generations and everything, and that genetic attack. Okay, we looked at how when you and I trust Christ, we're made bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We have his DNA then given to to us. He makes us a new creature. He makes us a new man. There's this geno, you know, we're, we're really the original geno project. There's this combining of the DNAs of, of, of us with him. And Satan seeks to pollute that. But then we saw, and that's in the book of DNA. And then we saw about the word of God in the book, that then God writes, and how Satan comes in, and he begins to corrupt that. And he begins to use, he subtracts and adds, water downs, deletes, all this stuff. And he's doing it so that we would move away from 
who we are in Christ. Satan understands that once you're saved and you're justified, that he seals you with that spirit, with the Holy Spirit of promise, and he cannot get you out of being who you are in Christ, but he can make you not live as who you are in Christ by convoluting the mess, by coming along and uh, making it no longer simple. Now, Ephesians chapter 3, run back there. Ephesians chapter 3. If you will look now, <clears throat> I want to talk this morning. We talked a little bit about Bibles and other Bibles and the Bible versions and everything. But I want to talk about something that kind of came up this past week in an email. My work week at, at work was horrible. Uh, I don't work 12-hour days, and I know why after this past week. But I did. Every day was a 12-hour day for some reason. And by the end of the week, I had no voice. I, I was just like, you know what, enough's enough. So Friday night, I took NyQuil because I'm congested. Then I couldn't quit coughing, so I took my cough medicine with codeine in it. I don't think I woke up till noon <laughs> Saturday. I'm like, whoa, you know. And I woke up with a start. You know how you go, oh, no, I forgot something. And that's how I woke up. So Saturday was a, a bummer day, you know. It was just like, boom. Ricky says, I th I'm glad you're still breathing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and it's just one of those things when you just want it to stop. But in the week, I got a couple emails about the Bible Project and about some things. And the question came up about the new King James Bible. Okay? So if you saw the title this morning, Why We Can't Trust the New King James. Because what has happened there is they've taken the King James Bible and they put new on it to move into you and I, to move into a new territory. And what happens is, is the, all of the new Bibles, all of the new versions, they attack the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look there in Ephesians 3, we saw there in verse number 9 uh, how that by Jesus Christ they completely take it out. If you look at verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is removed. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, they attack that verse. Why? Because everything the Father does is purposed where? In the Lord Jesus Christ. So they begin to attack it. And what would begin to happen is... Thomas Nielsen, uh, they began to make, they were making some inroads and, and into the Bible publishing game, and they noticed a market that was not being moved into. And it was the market where the people used the King, the, the King James Bible. Now, I bought this thing at the secondhand bookstore for a dollar. So it's the Possibility Thinker's Bible. Anyway, it tells you what it is, okay? So this was copyrighted in 1984 by Thomas Nelson. So they're moving into the market. By the way, Thomas Nielsen is no... I said Nelson, it's Nielsen. Nielsen is no longer Christian, period. They're so gone to the world that it's, it's pathetic. They're, they're off into the neo-evangelical -evangel uh, stuff, and it's just crazy. But And by the way, Zondran is close behind them if they're not there at this time um, and <laughs> all of the different Bible publishers and what began to happen in this is that they needed a Bible they got into the Bible Thomas Nielsen got into the Bible publishing so they needed a niche okay we need something to get in be able to get into the churches so they produced the new King James Bible. That was their niche into the Bible publishing game. Come over to Matthew 22 with me. Matthew chapter 22. And what happened there is when they began to do it, Matthew 22, okay, they began to make some assert, assert, assertions that aren't accurate. When you study and you look at the, the, the New King James compared to the King James. Now, this is the preface, okay? And I've marked it all up. The, in, in the preface, under the purpose, it says, in harmony with the purpose of the King James scholars, the translators and editors of the present work have not pursued a goal of innovation. 
they have perceived the Holy Bible, New King James Version, as a continuation of the labors of the early translators, thus unlocking for today's reader the spiritual treasures found especially in the authorized version of the Holy Scripture. So what do they say? We're just continuing on, okay? Now that's, that's what they promote, all right? <clears throat> then they give a living legacy, and we don't care about that. Complete equivalency in translation. Where new translations have been necessary in the New King James Version, the most complete representation of the original has been rendered by considering the history of the usage and etymology of the words in their con context, and then you go, blah. Okay? So they're, they're beginning to play the game. What's their original intent? We're just a continuation of... The King James. But now they get over here in the dynamic equivalency and they start using 10 gallon words that people go, huh? What is that? Okay. In faithfulness to our readers, it has seemed consistent with our task to cooperate with competent scholars who are governed by biblical principles of divine authorship of the Holy Scriptures. Therefore, all participating scholars have signed a document of subscription to the plenary and verbal inspiration of the original autographs of the Bible. You know what's critical in that? They signed a paper that we're going to trust the originals. Does God use originals? No, he uses copies. Matthew 22, Matthew 22 and verse 31. <clears throat> Matthew 22 and verse 31. The Lord is standing in the synagogue. Uh, if you believe the date at the top of the page, this is A.D. 33. Okay? And he says, verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but, at, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read... That which was spoken unto you by God, saying, and then he quotes Exodus chapter 3. Now, when was Exodus 3 written? Just a few years before A.D. 33, right? Just a few, uh, quite a bit. But yet he stands there reading from a copy and says, have you, you read the scriptures? These guys, we're going to go back to the originals, see, which they don't have, Okay. So he goes on here, and he, I got a lot of things, and we're not going to do a lot of reading of the preface. The point is, is what do they portray the New King James Bible to be? A simple continuation of the King James Bible, okay? All right? That's sneaky. That, Dad used a word one time called a mugwomp. You know what a mugwomp is? A mugwomp is someone that wants to be bo on both sides of the issue. So he's a, he's a fence sitter. He's got a foot in both camps. Now, Thomas Nielsen wants that because they're looking for that niche to get in. They're wanting me to stand up and say, everybody, we're moving to the new King James and da-da-da-da-da-da. And if you buy one, I get 50% of it and off you go. Remember I told you that story, okay? You see, folks, it, it's a compromiser. He's on half, half on one side, half on the other. And when you look at Matthew twenty-two thirty-one, 31, the great, one of the best verses on the definition of inspiration and preservation, they had, the, they had in written form what was spoken by God. They had it. Jesus Christ clearly tells them they've got it. Clearly quotes Exodus 3, verse 6, down to verse 32. <laughs> 1,500 years or better before, they've got it, it's there, and there's not a problem. You come over to Romans 16. Somebody asked me one time about translations. Well, that's no problem. God can handle a translation, can't he? Think about that. Deity language, God spoke it, talking to themselves, and he caused it to move down into humanity. Think about Moses. He talked. What language did he talk to Moses up on the hill by the burning bush? Hebrew, right? He come, bring the tablets, let's write them down. What did he write them in? Hebrew, right? Moses goes down, breaks them, write it again. 
Moses, go before Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go, says Jehovah. When Moses walked into Pharaoh, what language did he talk to Pharaoh in? Egyptian. Yeah. So God told Moses in Hebrew to go talk to Pharaoh in Egyptian. It was written down in Hebrew, translated into English for us to read today. And you know what it is? It is the Word of God all the way down through. So Romans 16, verse 26 but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all the nations for the obedience of faith. The commandment of God is to be made known to who? To all the nations. All the nations don't speak the same language. So therefore, what needs to happen? Translations need to happen. So translating is not a problem when done accurately from the right text. By the way, the difference between the New King James and your King James is textual. It's a text, a Greek text and a Hebrew text that are different. We looked last time about Christ wants His Word to be published throughout all the world. Well, if you're going to do that, then you're going to have to do what? A little translating. It's okay, folks. It's all right. It's not a taboo thing. But when you do it, we're going to be doing it from the right one. You go over to Acts 22. Paul stands up there on the porch. He speaks to the people in Hebrew. Luke recorded it in Greek. No problem. Okay? You with me? All right. So when you come to the New King James Bible, you come to a new tactic, if you will, by the policy of evil against you and I. Come over to Colossians chapter 1. That new tactic, actually make it Colossians 2, is designed to come in and and produce something in you and I that makes us become careless, makes us become compromisers, makes us become uh, a Bible agnostic, if you will. Okay? Because what it begins to do to for you, what he begins to do for you and I is because he begins to come in and then mess with that infallible, inerrant word of God and do it under the guise of something new, something that is just a continuation of. And in a minute, when we look at the verses, guess what you're going to find out? It's not. Okay? Colossians 2, if you will, quickly here. Colossians 2, notice, if you will, verse number 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Isn't that interesting? That's attack number one by the... You want to know how Satan attacks you and I? Here it is. Verse 4, verse 8, verse number 16, and verse number 18. He's going to come in and use what? enticing words is it easy is it smoother on someone to say you're not, you're going to go to hell or you're going to go to hades hades it's less offensive well you know what god's word has always offended man because god's word is negative toward man and positive toward god see now by the way the unbelievers don't use the word hades what do they say hell they know the right word to use but the Bible compromising guys come in and say what? Oh, we got to soften that. We don't want to offend and hurt. So we make the change. Okay? Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. By the way, how do you handle the enticing words? Well, you do verse 7. You're rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding there. You stick with the book. How do you handle not not after Christ and the philosophy of man and the traditions and the rudiments? Well, you're, verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. You remember who you're complete in. That's what you do. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in a 
respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is of Christ. How do you handle that when they bring under you under the religious scrutiny? It's a shadow. Is a shadow a real thing or is it just a representation? It's a fake. It's not the real deal. Well, how do you know that? Well, you know that because of studying and who you are. Verse 18, I love this one. Let no man beguile you of your reward and a voluntary humility. You're out there faking it till you can make it. Voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. They got you over here looking at some things that isn't even you. Voluntarily and, and intruding into those things which he hath not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. It's an interesting thing there. That worshiping of angels. In the New King James, just so you hear this, he says, Let no one defraud you of your reward. Take delight in false, taking delight in false humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath, has not seen, vainly puffed up, but the not seen has a footmark, a footnote mark on it. The, new, the Nestle's text, the, that's the minority text, omits not. So the, the New King James, a continuation of the King James Bible, that's how they promote it, what does he say? You can change it or not change it, it's up to you. He's a, he's a, sit, he's a fence sitter. He's got foot in each camp. He's trying to appease everyone. He's looking over there going, wait a minute, which one am I? Well, which one are you? <laughs> and now, I'll be honest with you, folks. You, you need to believe the Bible you're using. And you need to believe it until it tells you it's no longer the Word of God. I don't get upset with people who use a New King James. Because one day, you know what it's going to do? It's going to tell them it's not the Word of God. It's something else. It's a compromiser. It's something that isn't the real deal. Now, come over. We're going to just look at some verses, okay? you got your King James. I'm going to use the New King James as much as I can through all the little notes. Come over to 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And we're just going to do so, just a little verse turning for a little bit here, just so you can see. Now, I have nothing against Thomas Nielsen, never met the people. I just know, what are they saying that this book is? A continuation of the, new, of the King James Bible. If it was, then it would be what? The same thing as a King James Bible. <laughs> Somebody asked me one time, should we just get the old manuscripts together again and retranslate it into English. I said, why? You got it already. <laughs> and they're like, well, no, it would be the new one. I said, no, you, you don't need, you already got it. 1 John 3, look at verse 16. By the way, sometimes you ought to study the 3 16s. It's very interesting. 1 John 3, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, I'm not in chapter 3, am I? That's why it wasn't making sense to me either. Thank you. 1 John 3, 16. Hey, you got to jump on me. It's okay. For, yeah, I did. Uh, whole verses there, huh? Uh, Revelation. New, better write it down real quick. Just put C, C2, 16, okay? All right, 1 John 3, 16. B by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Do you see a problem? A little bit, huh? What's missing of God is missing. Hereby perceive we the love of God. The, the New King James says, by this we know love. And that's it. We know love. How do we know love? Whose love? Well, your King James Bible tells you the love of God, but the New King James doesn't tell you that. It, it's a, it, by the way, 316 is a great verse on the deity of Christ. There is no footnote 
in the New King James on 1 John 3.16. Footnote says you could or couldn't. This said there's no footnote at all on 3.16. That means the text that they used to translate over did not have the of God in it. That's not a continuation of the King James Bible. 2 John 7. 2 John and verse 7. 2 John and verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an anti-Christ. You see that for many deceivers have gone out into the world. What does it say? Entered. 2 John 7. Is entered and going out the same thing? No. By the way, in the Greek text, there are two different Greek words. Why? One's coming from the majority text, your King James Bible. The new King James has reached over into the minority text and snagged it. Jude 19. Jude 19. New Jude 19. <clears throat> These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. Is causing divisions... See that? Who? Jude 19. These are sensual persons who cause divisions. What does the, your book say? These by they who separate themselves, having sensual, having not the Spirit. Divisions. You stay in and you cause trouble. But separating yourselves is what? Leaving. Getting away from them. See that? It's not an update, folks. It's a change. Revelation 16. Revelation 16. Revelation 16. You know why we don't use a new King James? Because it is, it, is, it is a lie. It says we're a continuation of the atmosphere and the, of the King James translators, and that's a lie. It's a bold-faced lie. It sits on the fence using footnotes saying you can go either side you want. And, oh, by the way, we like this over here better than that over there, so we're going to dibble and we're going to dabble. Revelation 16 and verse number 16. This one is pretty harsh right here. 1616, and they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. Okay, what does yours say? And he, right? See how they leave out the he? Who's the he? Who's the he? Well, Zephaniah 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 8 says, this is God Almighty, this is Jehovah. This is who's doing this. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, the New King James leaves out the he. Leaves out who's doing the judgment. Le leaves it to nothing, no one, because it's a they. And they gathered them. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's broadened it out. God's the one that gathers them up. Come back to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> Many years ago, I was talking, to, dealing with a young man about the Bible issue. And what I'm doing with you is what I did with him. Because until you see it black and white on the page, Acts 4, you won't... You, you can just talk all day long about Vaticanus, Sanicaeus, Alpha, Beta... Papyri, Philippi, Monii, all that stuff out there. Half that's made up, okay? I just made it up, okay? You can talk all day long to your blue in the face about this, and, and it'll just glaze over people's eyes. But when you start showing them verses, the verses, you use the Bible you use till it no longer tells you it's the what? The Word of God. Acts 4 and verse 27. Acts 4:27. Right, ready? 
For truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and holy what? Acts 4.27. I'm reading the New King James. What, what happened there? Your holy what? Is child and servant different? Yeah. Oh, don't you better believe it. Verse 30. Just so you know, it's not a mistake. Verse 30, by stretching out your hand to heal, and, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Ooh, holy child. Now, child and servant in the Greek are the same Greek word. They chose to translate it servant and not child. They're confused. Because who is he? He's the son of God. He is the holy child. How do you know that? Well, look right before that. Verse 27. Okay. Now watch verse 28. Well, verse 26, I'm sorry. Go back up to verse 25. Who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, We did the he why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain things? He's quoting folks Psalms 2. The king of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his Christ for a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed. He's quoting Psalms 2, and you know what Psalms 2 says? It's the holy, it's the child, the holy child, not the servant that's doing this. They've missed it. This is about him being the Son of God, not the suffering servant of the Lord. Because he does come as a suffering servant. But this isn't about that. This is about him being who he is, which is the Son of God. What it, they didn't, by the way, all the new Bibles say the same thing as the New King James Bible, just FYI. Do you see that? Child and servant. Same Greek word, they just translated it differently to say something that Psalms 2 doesn't say. You guys with? All right, 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. The problem with the New King James is that it says, it paints a picture of one thing, and then when you go read it in reality, it's not. It's, it belongs over in the pile with the others. 1 Timothy 6, look at verse number 5. I'm going to get there. 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 5. This one cracks me up every time I read it. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 5. Ready? 1 Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6, verse 5. Verse 5. Okay? You ready? Useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw thyself. Your book says gain is godliness, right? A means of gain is what the New King James says. That's different. Again, same Greek words here, but yet they translate it the same way as the New Bible people. They change it. And the reason is, is that they don't understand the doctrine that Paul's teaching here. You follow that? They, they don't get it. They're just in it to get that niche into the market. So a new, look down at verse 10, 610. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. All kinds. All kinds. They don't get it. They don't understand the context. They don't understand the doctrine. They're just going along with everybody else. It doesn't allow... In, in your King James Bible, when the translators sat, they considered the doctrine being taught in the passage, in the context. Okay, They may not have understood every little nook and cranny, but
but they understood the context. They understood something wonderful about your Bible. The New King James doesn't allow the use of the context to be a part of the situation. They come in and they just do a hack job and make it read like everybody else reads. Okay? Now, let me do something with you. Go to Genesis 1. Okay? On your way... Yeah, just keep going. Get Genesis 1 and verse 1 on your way. I am think I was debating about doing Kings and Chronicles, but we'll see if I got time. We'll come back to it. Genesis 1 and verse 1. Okay? Genesis 1, 1. Again, folks, to say that the new King James is a King James is a lie heresy. It's a, just a new Bible. Okay? Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's okay? Yours says heaven. Now look at 2.1. 2.1. Thus the heavens and the earth and, and all the hosts of them were finished. Right? You got the plurality in 2.1. Well, now let's think about what we know happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 2-1. Okay? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then some judgment happened, and he goes back in and he recreates, if you will, a first heaven, a second heaven, and then a third heaven, right? Thus in 2-1 we have what? Heavens. Right? The New King James Bible's translators don't even understand that. Because the word for heaven and heavens in the Hebrew are the same words. So how did the King James translators get it to be heaven and everybody else get it to be heavens? The King James translators understood that between 1-1 one, one, and 2-1, three heavens were created and made it the plurality and left it singular and plural. They understood that. These guys don't, and they got enough degrees behind their names to give them a high temperature. I mean, it's unreal, the education that these men are supposed to have had. But they can't just simply stop and read the context. Come over to 3.15, Genesis 3. Folks, you know, that's why I keep telling you, you know more about your Bible than the guys coming out of seminary. You do. Even, I mean, even, you know, I don't know much. You still know more than they know. Yeah. Yeah, they, they got a lot of claiming. All right, uh, Genesis 3, look at verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The seed line begins, right? Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be your husband and he shall rule over you. So we have the seed line begin, right? And we have the seed line It's going to go through the woman to Abraham. Come over to Genesis 22. To Abraham, then to Isaac, then to uh, um, Jacob. And then all the way down to Israel, to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Watch Genesis 22. <clears throat> Genesis 22 and verse 17. 22, 17. 22, 17. You ready? In blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your descendants. As the stars of the heavens and as the sand is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemy. Okay, verse 18. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you obey my voice. In verse 17, what should it be? It should be seed. 
the new, new has descendants. In verse 18, they use seed. So they understand how to translate the Hebrew word seed for seed and for descendants. They know how to do it. They know how to translate it. But when they use descendants, are all the descendants of Abraham going to inherit the land? The answer is no. You got that little dude named Ishmael out there, don't you? <laughs> and then you got Isaac, but then Isaac had two boys, Esau and Jacob. You got Jacob, he's descendants. You got Esau, now he claims the land. What did the new do? The new left it open for any of the descendants to come on board. Whoops, is right. Yes, sir. Right. Right. Yep. And they call it descendants instead of seed. Yep. Chapter 13 of Genesis. 13 and verse 15. Yep. The seed line starts, Genesis 3.15. We follow it all the way down to Christ, don't we? It goes very specific. I've chosen Jacob over Esau. The elder shall serve the younger. It's not Ishmael, it's Isaac. All right? So it's not all descendants, and they say it's all descendants. Genesis 3, I'm sorry, 13. Genesis 13 and verse number 15. Genesis 13 and verse number 15. If for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. All the land, the descendants for how long? Forever. Now, hang on a minute, there's a footnote on the verse. Literally, seed. And so throughout the book. So the footnote contradicts the passage we read a minute ago. They use descendants instead of seed. Yet they know how to translate the words correctly. They just choose not to. Because do you know a little group over there that claims the land as well as the nation of Israel? So what are we going to do? We're going to appeal now to everyone who is going to embrace all those groups. It's a little sneaky, isn't it? A little sly, a little subtle. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I, I did. When I got the email back, I, I politely, you know, talked to them and so forth and made a decision to do this because the best way for, to do it is for you to read these verses. And I'll be honest with you folks, when I say the Greek word in Hebrew, I just looked them up in the strong concordance. I didn't look at the de definition. I just looked at the words to say they were the same because there they're, they're, they are. They're the same. Hebrews chapter 2. The descendant and the seed thing, I just, <clears throat> I don't know, blind, bad, flying backwards in a dark cave can see this stuff. But, but you have to understand the doctrine. That's the thing. And if you don't understand the doctrine to get us down to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're just going to pitch the whole thing. You throw the baby out with the bathwater. Might as well. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 16. Hebrews 2, 16. Did you have something, Lay? I'm sorry. The, nothing. Red letter is simply a, a marketing ploy to think that you've got something special in your Bible. Because God, the, in the beginning was the Word, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The whole book is the Word. It's Yeah, it's just a marketing ploy. Again, get a little niche, because now we have something special. we got the, the Word of the Lord in red letters. The whole book should be read. <laughs> okay? Anyway, all right? Hebrews 2, verse 16. Hebrews 2, 16. <clears throat> you ready? I got to find it. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Hebrews 2. Oh, 2, 16. Did I, I, I read it right. 2.16. 2.16. I'm in the wrong version, remember. For indeed he does give aid to angels, but he does, he does not give aid to angels, sorry, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Do you see that thing about the seed of Abraham? 
but he talks about the nature of angels. Nature of angels. And he gives, and the New King James says, gives aid. It's not even, it's like, what are you, what are you talking, exactly, what are you talking about? So now, now watch the verse carefully, because they're, they're doing something here. Are you and I made a little lower than the angels? Yeah, watch it. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels. Okay, your King James says, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels but he took on him the seed of Abraham. But he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Those two verses are saying two entirely different things. What did the, Lord, what did the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, do? He was made of the seed of Abraham. He took on the nature, the, 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 the humanity. He didn't give aid to humanity. He didn't give aid to Abraham. He does that later, but not in that verse. Also, what the New King James is doing is making you and us and angels equal on the same playing field. So I'm your angel. <laughs> no. Okay? He, he became flesh. He didn't give aid. Okay? So again, come back over with me to... Matthew 21, where we started. Matthew 21. You know what? Uh, let's just go to Philippians. I just, ah, man, I got to do that, Matthew, though. Come on. M Matthew 21. Oh, I know. The groans are hell. And furthermore, Matthew 21. And verse 32. This is a great verse. Matthew 21, 32. Matthew 21, 32. Okay? For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not behave, but, uh, believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. What, the end of that verse, is relent and repented the same thing? No. Not at all. Not even close. They're different. You know why they're different? Wrong text. That's why they're different. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. Got to go quickly here. Philippians 2. Philippians 2. So with the New King James, it's not a continuation of, it's rather something brand spanking new. Philippians 2, verse 6. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. 2, 6. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Footnote. <clears throat> Again. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The robbery part is footnoted out in the other text. Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Actually, that Philippians 2, there's something else in that verse. Who being in, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery. In your vote, it thought it not robbery. Consider and thoughts different. Okay? Colossians 4. Colossians 4, verse number 24. Coloss That's not even right. Galatians 4. Can't read my writing, sorry. Can't read my writing. I'm in a hurry now. So, Galatians 4. If you've got verse 24, I'd like to read it. Galatians 4, verse 24. Galatians 4, verse 24. Which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants the one from Mount Sinai, which gave birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Does your say anything about symbolic? It says an allegory, doesn't it? You know why? Different text. That's a different textual issue. 1 Corinthians. And we'll stop here, okay? 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> I got a list, folks. It's unreal. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> verse 22. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Do the Jews request or require? They require. John 4, the Psalms, they require a sign. Where are our signs? Verse 18, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, to those... But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Are you being or are you saved? That's bad. That is really bad. Really, really bad. Ver verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching, uh, of the message preached to save those who believe. Message. You, they wrote that word in. That's not even in the Greek text. It isn't even in the Greek text they use. They wrote that one in, making it up on the fly. 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Are you to be diligent or are you to, are you to study? You're to study. Okay. And by the way, that, that word diligent, is, uh, anyway, we don't have the time. It's amazing when you, diligent does have the issue of study in it. But to study the book rightly divided is very specific, okay? You go to Galatians 2, verse 7, and it's the for, the of, and the for. Galatians 2. I don't like this Bible. It isn't mine. That's right. Galatians 2, verse 7. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcision had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcision was to Peter, it should be of, right? You go over to chapter 2, drop down to verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be. we got us a problem, don't we? Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We got us a problem. Okay? Now, come over. Yeah, two of them. Um, oh. Well, we didn't make noon. So, come back to 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2. Folks, this, I wouldn't waste your time if I didn't think this was important because we all deal with people who don't like the NIV, don't like the NASB, don't like the ESV, don't like all that other, but who will latch on to a new King James. And the problem, because it's a King James, exactly, it's in the name. And they get into it, and you know what happens? It's a lie. 2 Corinthians 2.17, For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God, but as a sincerity, but as from God we speak in the sight of God, our truth, our God in Christ. Are we peddling the Word of God? No. Yeah. Chapter 4, yeah, they, they replace corrupt the Word of God with peddling. That's because that's what they're doing, it's corrupting the Word, yeah. How about 4-2? Look over at chapter 4, verse 2. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, Shame and dishonesty aren't the same. <laughs> okay? Go over to Ecclesiastes. Uh, you know what? Don't do that. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 11. <clears throat> this is what they did. i to find it. Ecclesiastes. Man, this book is... I don't recommend this Bible to anybody. Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. And verse 11, 
Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 11. <clears throat> the words of the wise are like, are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Is that anything? Okay. So they got a footnote on, on this verse. The, on the, scholar, the words of scholars, nine, it says literally, masters of the assemblies. This, that's what they're doing. They've added the word scholar instead, and took out the master of assemblies. You see that? Are you, do you, are you with me there? Okay. Now, one more, and this one is a big one for me. Come over with me to Hebrews, back with me to Hebrews, chapter 2, chapter 3. You see, folks, the big issue in these guys is that they're using the wrong text to do their translating. The problem with the King James Bible and why you can't trust it is it says it, it, may, it promotes itself to be a continuation of the King James Bible and hopefully in the in the 50 minutes here, you've seen that it's a what? It's a lie. Now, second, get Hebrews 3. I had it, now I just closed it. Hebrews 3. And look with me at verse 16. Okay? Hebrews 3, 16. All right? Hebrews 3, 16. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? No, Hebrews 3.16. I'm in this Bible. The New King James Bible says, Everybody reveled. Okay, you with me? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? He said that everybody that came out of Egypt led by Moses did what? Rebelled. Is that true? No, there were two people, two men who didn't. Who were they? Caleb and Joshua. Now, okay, I'm going to use, now go back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Come on now, we're almost done. You have to look at me, I've got to look at you guys. Oh, yeah. Oh. I hear the mumbling back there. Yeah, it's getting there. Look at Deuteronomy 1. Yeah, thank you. Deuteronomy 1. And look at verse 36. Deuteronomy 1 and verse 36. Deuteronomy 1, 36. You ready? Except Caleb, the son of Jephna. He shall see it, and to him and his children I am giving the land on which he walked, because he wholly followed the Lord. Verse 38, But Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. In their own Bible is a lie. Hebrews 2 says, Everyone that came out rebelled. Then when you go study it in Deuteronomy... Guess who didn't rebel? Caleb. And, so Hebrews 2 is wrong. It's a lie within its own pages. Okay? And you can do that all a, a lot. All right? Folks, my point is, is when we talk about the Word of God being for English-speaking people in a King James Bible, Satan doesn't like it, so he's... The course of the world generates this kind of stuff, and it's subtle. There are little changes, not big ones, but, very, but they are big in the scheme of it, okay? So why can't you trust the, King, the new King James Bible? Because it's a fence sitter. It's got feet on both sides. It's a mugwomp. Yeah, I love that word, okay? All right? But that's what it is. Now, Satan uses that against you and I because we're going to stand for the old King James, and we're going to preach and teach that. And I'll be honest with you, when you run into people who have different Bibles, just tell them, use, trust your Bible till it no longer allows you to trust it. 
and show them a few verses and let them decide. Okay? All right? You follow all that? All right. It's not 1215 yet. <laughs> all right. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for who we are in your son, that we have your word that promotes him, and that we'll do that for your honor and glory. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's...